Welcome to PR Tech Wednesdays, the weekly webinar where thought leaders discuss the latest in PR tech. If it's Wednesday, it's PR Tech Wednesdays. I'm your host, Eric Schwartzman. We do this every Wednesday from 12 to 1 p.m. Pacific time. It's free, and you can sign up at prtechwednesdays.com. Our guest today is Steve Lohr. He's a senior writer and technology reporter from the New York Times. He's a leading expert on the corporations that dominate computing today. Steve, welcome to PR Tech Wednesdays. Uh, glad to be there. Thank you, Eric. I want to start with a quick shout out to the EFF, the Electronic Freedom Foundation champions user privacy, free expression and innovation through impact litigation, policy analysis, grassroots activism, and technology development. The Electronic Freedom Foundation is a U.S. 501c3 nonprofit, and you can donate online at erichschwartzman.com forward slash EFF. Hmm. Our bookstagram of the week is brought to you by the 2020 Startups Guide for PR, which you can download and learn how to sequence PR campaigns based on your growth stage at erichschwartzman.com forward slash startup. So this week's bookstagram is The Mom Test by Rob Fitzpatrick. Rob is a tech entrepreneur who learned the hard way that what people tell you in the early stage about your company is generally wrong and how to avoid and getting on bad, getting and acting on bad information when you're at a tech startup searching for a product market fit. Now this book is about how to talk to customers and learn if your business is a good idea when everyone's lying to you because they don't wanna hurt your feelings and just want to make you go away. It has all sorts of practical tips on asking the right questions. It's a quick read. And if you're not at a tech startup and you do any kind of market research, this book will help you cut through the niceties and capture better insights. It's a wonderful little book. Check it out. All right, let's do this. I have, uh, I have plenty of questions, so be as brief as you like. I sure. promise we will not run out of things to talk about. Okay. So now, since the last time we met, uh, it was 2006, you keynoted the PRSA Technology Conference, and at the time, you were not 100% allocated to technology news. And today, tech crosses over into economics and politics. Um, it's really so much more than just a, a business news beat. Absolutely. It's, um, it's, it's, you know, it's part of the fabric of everything, really. So, so tell us what you cover primarily these days. Um, I think of my beat as uh, technology and economics, um, and that uh, covers a broad swath of things. So uh, recently I've done a lot on uh, uh, competition issues in big tech, antitrust. Since uh, in the past I was the, uh, uh, covered the Microsoft investigation and trial uh, in the 90s, and it was uh, along at the time along with the OJ trial and the Lindbergh trial, the only one we wrote about every single day. Um, and now, with uh, the four big tech companies, uh, Google, Amazon, uh, Facebook, and Apple to some degree, um, you know, a lot of these issues have come back. So, so I'm doing, you know, do, doing that, and I do a lot of kind of workplace stuff, you know, um, you know, kind of my classic uh, description of this is, you know, 15, 20 years ago, I remember asking Bob Reich, who was then the labor, labor secretary, uh, had left being labor secretary, what's your best bet for good jobs in the modern economy for the two thirds of Americans who do not have four year college degrees? And his answer at the time was uh, geek squad for everything else. You know, the best buy people, the care and the feeding of all machine, machines in all kinds of industries. I mean, the, it's a pretty good answer then. It's, the answer today would be more software inflected. But um, so I'm, I'm interested in a lot of those programs that uh, uh, try to prepare people for careers which happen to be, I mean, tech is only part of it because there seems to be demand there and uh, you can actually measure the skills. So there's a number of programs that have uh, looked at that, mostly nonprofits that I've, are the ones I've written about. Uh, for everyone that's uh, on the call, I want you to know that uh, the chat room is open for questions. So if you have questions for Steve, put them in there. Um, walk us through, I mean, you know, I, 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 here I, we have a little porthole into the gray lady, uh, you know, in, in Manhattan and we see, you know, activity in the newsroom. Walk us through, if you would, sort of the process be, behind how an idea becomes an article in the New York Times. Um, 
Yeah, it, look, it depends on the subject. I mean, if they're if you're in Washington covering breaking news, and stuff's obvious. Um, if you're in a more feature writing beat, you uh, you propose a story to your editor, and they say yes or no, or we think this is a good idea, but you'd like to steer it in this direction, and you know, then comes then it's up to you to do it. It's not particularly complicated. I mean, so I, nobody you know, has newspapers. I mean, you know, news organizations are just incredibly decentralized organizations. For, so for nobody the, has the carte blanche. Like you can't go and say, look, this is what I want to write. You still have to get approval from someone. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, you basically tell them you're going to do it. I mean, uh, you know, uh, you know, if you're just starting out, you got to get sort of approval. Yeah. I mean, you don't, um, I don't know. There's not too many no's. <laughs> Truth be known. Is there some sort of a meeting that you have, all, everyone in your department, where you come together? The, and the, the tech group has a meeting uh, Monday midday, uh, one thirty our time, ten thirty San Francisco time, uh, and people talk about you know things that are coming up. Um, I mean, we also have a kind of list of stories that you're working on and so forth. So it isn't sure, it isn't you know everybody go around and show and tell, um, but it's mainly kind of what to be aware of, you know, the current week, and then any other kind of things they have to discuss. Is there any sort of technology platform that you guys have so that everyone can see what everyone else is working on so there's no overlap? Yeah, I mean, we've got a Google Doc with a, with a story list that's, you know, available to everyone. <laughs> it's simple. It's a simple Google Doc. Yeah. How many yeah, people I, in that meeting, in that tech meeting? <sighs> It sort of depends, but I, yeah, um, people come in from different places. Yeah, 15, 16 kind of thing. And several of them, I imagine, teleconferencing in? Yeah, I mean, the China and London people only rarely do. Um, but yeah, every, yeah, people, it's Washington. I mean, half the San Francisco Bureau kind of shows up, it doesn't. I mean, they all call, they they all work, you know they all work from home for largely or a lot of them do. To be fair, not all. Of them. Um, is it a structured meeting? Is there like a set format, or how, no, how does it go? How no, long does it take? It depends. Pewing Tam is the um, is the technology editor, and she starts it out and uh, says what the agenda is. And if there's not much to say, with it can be a short meeting. It can be it can range from twenty to forty minutes. So um, once you get the go ahead on a story, talk, talk to us a little bit about, you know, if it's a if it's a story that involves a company, talk to us about uh, whether or not you use that company's website to gather information. Do you care about a company's website? Does it matter? Yeah, it's one thing I always check as I do LinkedIn for anybody I'm talking to. Um, I rarely do stories on individual companies themselves. I mean, the throwaway line I always use to people is, you know, I'm not going to write about an individual company unless it's a large one in trouble, and then I have to. Um, but, and that's not entirely true, but a lot, most of what I do are kind of theme stories that, um, that include individual companies. But yeah, I, look, the, the company website, particularly for startups, right, is illuminating, um, or can be. It gives you a good overview of what, you know, what they do, so. Um, it's, yeah, it's one thing to look at. Is it enough if it's on a company website or do you need to sort of verify that? Like, do you trust information on a company website? Um, well, it depends what it is. I mean, it, it, you know, if it's anything with, uh, you know, the investor um, site, whether it's an SEC filing or something like that, of course, um, you know, hum and different websites are done different ways. I mean, some are, you know, you have the equivalent of FAQs which, you know, answer basic questions and others are, you know, are, are more marketing. Um, so. Uh, this is a, a question from Mark Mor uh, Morgenstein comes in on the chat room. He says, what's the balance for you and your team regarding day of news and long form features? And when do feet and, and when do when, and when you do features, do you like to find characters on your own or do you like to be provided with characters? Um, yeah, look, you like to, you like to find characters on your own usually. Um, as far as the, the first question, the mix of daily stuff versus, um, 
uh, features, it's, you know, you're always aware of what's going on daily, but there aren't many really daily stories for us. I mean, I get, you know, pitches all the time about some funding round or some partnership announcement and so forth. And, I, you know, we're not going to do that. I mean, that way lies madness. You know, it's just, you know, that's that's not what we do. And that's not where we add value. I mean, if you're doing something everybody else is doing, it's, you know, I mean. Do you pay attention to any corporate blogs? Um, no, except when I'm referred to them. You know, if I see a link to something, we took, we took up this issue here, you ought to take a look at that or something on Twitter refers to it, I do. But I, I don't, I don't, there's no routine blogs, corporate blogs that I'm watching. Are you using any of the public relations newswire services? You know, the ones that are used by publicly traded companies to make non-selective disclosures? No, again, I mean, this you're talking about like the PR newswire, right? Stuff like that. Or business wire or yeah. Globe right. newswire. Right. There's, yeah. there's quite a few of them. Yeah, I mean, only when it comes up on a search. And so when it does come up on the search, uh, do you read press releases? Yeah, sure, I can. No question. Do you read them or do you just skim them? I mean, do you ever actually read all the way down to the boilerplate and read the boilerplate? Um, well, uh, the boilerplate is that you know that part that, at the bottom that says you know what the company does, right? So yeah, um, yeah. I mean, that can sometimes be the most illuminating, but mostly, I mean, those kinds of press. You look for what people said in the past. I mean, I'm not you know scouring around for what daily news I'm going to jump on. It's you know no way. But I mean, if, you know, if they said it was the bee's knees, you know, a year ago and, uh, you know, this thing has since tanked, that's kind of interesting. Uh, this question comes from Jill. She says, what holds more weight in securing a story? Numbers, you know, quantitative information like revenue, user count or uniqueness of the product? Something new, news, new and, and useful. Um. Yeah, I, again, I, you know, there are not too many things, you know, they would fit in as ingredients in a story. Um, and something that catches your attention is one thing, but it's, you, you know, usually it's the whole point of doing a lot of these stories is that there, there is a, you know, something is reflective of something broader, right? Some broader trend. And that is usually, is, you know, these days, if you can't measure that, it probably is not there. Let, let's um, let's break it down. I don't want to just be generic on this next question, but I want to talk about, you know, engaging with public relations people. Mm -hmm. And I want to talk about your preferences. So let's say it's hard news, something breaking that is, you know, of importance. How do you want to be contacted in that case? Um, yeah, it, not only rarely. I mean, in a sense, it's got to be pretty big news. I was, I was, you know, um, you know, before IBM announced that Ginny Rometty was going to step down, right, after the close of the market one day, I mean, I did get in touch. I got a call from, you know, one of the top PR guys there at, at IBM, it's almost at the same time as crossing the wire, right? So, I mean, there's that. Other than that, I mean, I, I um, telephone, you know, kind of telephone calls on daily news, it, it's got to be pretty big. It's got to be very big, actually. I mean, for, for for us to cover it. But if it is really big, do you want a phone call or an email? Um, I want if it's really big, I want both. Mm -hmm. Just so I don't miss it, you know, don't miss it. How many emails are you getting each day? How many email pitches would you say you're getting each day? I don't know about pitches, but um, but. Um, I, you know, I've got an old email address, which is kind of widely used. And let's just see. Um, um, uh, my inbox has 310,493 emails. Just just to frame it, you know. Um, so, I, you know, I can get 40, 50 emails a day. But usually 40 or 50. I mean, it, but usually... Um, and, you know, some, some small, tiny percentage of them I will open. Some of them, you know, if you're working on a story and people are back and forth and do fact-checking, I mean, that stuff is what you're looking for. Other things that come in, I, you know, might uh, do it at the end of the day to sort of take a look at what we got. 
Do you use any spam filtering technology to screen out bulk email sends? No. I mean, but the New York Times has some. And so so of those 40 to 50, what percentage would you say you, you open? 10%. And and you open it based on the subject line, the yeah. sender. Yeah, the, the subject line. Also, the sender. I would imagine if it's of, coming of from. Yeah, yeah. If it's you know, I mean, it's you know, look, if it's somebody you know, I mean, I you you owe them the courtesy, <laughs> right to reply. I mean, I just yeah, you know, um, you know, thanks, but no thanks or whatever. But you know, so I and I look. It just uh, some of it's just arbitrary. Something comes in if you can. You know, it's obviously not for me. It might be of interest to somebody else um, at the time. So I, you know, reply and pass on the email address of the uh, of the other reporter. And and what what makes a good subject line? Are there any trigger words? I mean, <laughs> no. I mean, it has to look. It has to sync with something I'm looking at or interested in. Um, and so, um, but no, I mean, there's no dog whistle, <laughs> right? That's good. Oh my God, I got to open that, right? You know, Graydon Carter had those um, empty modifier words that are so famous that he, everyone talks about. He had this list of like empty modifier words that could not be included in stories. And they were words that were so overused that they were devoid of meaning. Mm -hmm. For me, the one I keep seeing in tech that just comes up over and over again is effective and efficient. You know, I mean, okay, it increases productivity, you know, to do what? Are there any sort of empty modifier keywords that if you see them in a subject line, it's like, yeah, I'm not opening that. Oh, I won't say I'm not opening it, but, you know, I mean, look, they're the, the usual overused marketing terms. I mean, everything is AI now, right? I mean, three years ago, what we used to call data science, which was a bunch of, you know, a lot of data plus machine learning algorithms is all now branded AI. There's no company that doesn't engage in AI. So, so you know, the filter there to get over that towards something substantive is pretty high. Um, but... There aren't, I mean, I'm, they're, they're not set words that, you know, set me off one way or another. I mean, it just, you know. Um. So um, how do you feel if, um, you know, someone goes around you if you don't reply? Like they, they send you something, they don't hear back, and then they go to someone else I, on your team. Totally free market. I'm fine with it. I, there's no, I mean, if, if you're proprietary, you're doing too little. <laughs> There's plenty to go around. I, I, I don't. I don't have any problem with. That. I mean, you know, it's one thing if you're you know, halfway into a story, right? And so you know, then it's because you've invested some time, right? But right. I, I, other than that, I, I just you know, I, look, I, I, it is. It's you know, people have different time. They're not focused on one thing at a particular time. I wouldn't care almost what it is. You couldn't get to something else for three days. Yada yada. You know, all that kind of stuff goes into the mix. Um, so. I, I think it's, I, to me, it's a free market. There's no proprietary stuff. It's like when I was overseas for a decade for the Times, Tokyo, Manila, London, bunches of places in between. But in London, I was, we were in the same building as the, uh, as the Wall Street Journal. And I, uh, you know, they wanted to ask what, the, you know, what, what, what working with the uh, uh, bureau chief was like. And uh, the journal, I mean, bureau chiefs, were filters. I mean, they, you know, they could control what story pitches went in. You had to get it past them to get the pitch inside. So Joe Lelleville was, my, was what, the bureau chief when I was asked this. I said, hey, I don't think he reads my stuff when it goes in the paper, let alone before it goes in. I mean, it just, it's a, you know, it, it's a, it's a pretty free marketplace. And always has been. Uh, this next question is from Amy, Amy Robin. She says, do, uh, do you ever take in-person meetings with corporate folks for background or introductions? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I do. I do. I don't, I mean, I, you know, I, again, do it regularly if that way lies madness, but it's got to be something that captures my attention. I mean, it, but you know, this, I don't have enough time for, uh, you know, outgoing, letting alone, letting alone incoming. But if, you know, look, if, if somebody's uh, in an industry that I'm, you know, looking at or doing something that looks particularly intriguing, I, you know, um, yeah, I do. 
I do. I, I just, you know, I try to limit it to a couple times a week. Yeah, you know, because otherwise, again, it just, you know, it just chews you up. What's a good length for an email? Introductory email, sort of a query, just to take your temperature on whether or not you might be interested in a story. Three paragraphs. I mean, arbitrarily, but yeah. Um, Attachments, okay or no? Yeah, I mean, sure. I mean, it depends. I mean, but if it, if the first three paragraphs don't get you interested, the, the attachment is you know you aren't going to go to it. So, you know, who the who the person company is, you know, what they're doing that's intriguing. Um, you know, it, it's you know it's it's the pitch. You know, it's the pitch on a on an idea the same way they talk about sort of you know the VC elevator pitch. You know. <clears throat> What's your idea? Who's on your team? Who's backing you? <laughs> right? Um, that's, you know, to get attention for s stories, it's, you know, it's somewhat, uh, at individual companies, it's somewhat the same. This next question comes from Garrett. He says, what are your pet peeves when reading story ideas, pitch emails? I, somebody has no idea what I've done. <laughs> Or what I, you know, I mean, you have to know who you're dealing with. I mean, you, it's so obvious to see the stuff that somebody just pasted your name in the top of it. And it's, a, you know, right. And it's, it's a carte blanche email. I, it's just, you know, I mean, they're used to, it's, you know, it's got to have something that, you know, that resonates, you know, look at what the person's done last, you know, six months or a year. Does any of this resonate with any of that or not? I mean, you know, that's, that's a pretty good indication. So I, I, you know, I know you, you've been covering uh, antitrust for years and that seems to have heated up for you yeah. uh, lately. Yes. Yes. Um, are there, is that what you're most interested in right now? Or is there anything else you're tracking closely? And that question's from Sarah. Yeah. I mean, look, there's themes. That's one of the themes. Again, this kind of, uh, you know, the progression of, modern you know ai technology through the workplace is another one you know where it's where it shines where it stumbles um is another thing and these kind of workplace issues that i mentioned before you know um how you get more inclusiveness um you know thing. And, that, and i look at that as frankly just you know everything's a tech story <laughs> so that are, is so that is you know are you are you looking pretty uh, you know intensely at ai right now is that something that you are covering yeah sure Sure. And so, you know, when when we think about AI as this black box versus artificial general intelligence, you know, the idea that, you know, not just can AI solve some narrow problem, but can AI actually solve a human problem, uh, like analyze the sentiment of a story? Uh, what's your opinion on that? Yeah, I mean, sentiment's probably pretty easy, actually other things it can do because what, what you know with those the sentiment analysis stuff does is is link words to sentiment and then it, it's a matching problem so that's not hard i mean what people generally think of as general human general ai is um, you know the simplest explanation is you know reason as a child does you know goes out and sees the world makes sense of it without thousands and thousands or millions of of cases of data Right. And that's that's, um, you know, you don't have to worry too much about that. It isn't going to happen anytime soon. There's a young guy who is in here who's an AI expert and he was he's got to start up. And as he said about general AI, that's a very few people drinking large amounts of Kool-Aid. Um, it, it, it's, you know, the kind of uh, one of the nice things about the quotidian stuff is that actually that's where you're really going to get productivity gains. <laughs> you're going to build businesses. Um, you know, things like uh, robotic process, process automation. I did a piece on that a couple of years ago. And, it, you know, and it, you know some, I think Tom Malone was the guy who said it, to, um, or Tom Davenport at the time said, you know, it's the lowest imaginable form of artificial intelligence, right? The least intelligent form of artificial intelligence. And that's, I mean, that's where it kind of rises up. And then there are big questions. I mean, how, how, how broad can natural language processing go? for example, I mean, because that eats into all the knowledge professions. Um, and what the great advances since 2012 in, d in deep learning have been in, um, you know, classification and recognition problems. That is in 
uh, image recognition, speech identification, translation, and so forth. So, I, and those are interesting, but they're kind of you know specific things. And so even, I, even play, playing Go board games. Board games are great. They're a bounded world. You know, um, I'm I'm writing a, a report now on the state of media monitoring. And so I've been briefing with a lot of the CEOs of the news and social media monitoring platforms. And then I've been kind of gut checking what I hear from them against academics at Stanford and other schools that are mm. in doing natural language processing. And, um, you know, basically what I'm hearing, you know, here's one example. Um, let's say, for example, there was an article written about um, maybe a roundup story about uh, um uh, uh, mobile phone services, comparing the quality or the rather the richness of the of the subsidies of various services against each other. I mean, you'd have things like you know, the speed of the network, consistency of the network, the deals in place to afford you handsets. There'd be so many different topics and subtopics in a story like that, comparing the services to each other. That if you tried to reduce, you know, the, the sort of the, the final judgment on whether or not that piece was positive or negative to a single sentiment, it would be impossible. And if what you're doing is counting words, mm -hmm. right, and processing language rather than understanding language, right, that information would not be accurate. And so what I'm hearing, what seems to be the consensus I'm hearing from most of people who are much smarter than me is, you know, when it comes to uh, something like natural language understanding, you know, that is a form of AGI and we are not there yet. And so human assisted AI, when it comes to interpreting sentiment is, you know, very reasonable, but to automate that process is really risky. Yeah, um, I'd agree. I, um, it, it's, you know, I, it will, for example, I mean, this is a few years back, but there was uh, a piece I did on uh, artificial intelligence in uh, in the legal profession, right? And they, you know, at earlier years, their individual, you know, kind of uh, electronic discovery and so forth had been, and, and there were these predictions that lawyers would go away, right? And it, what happened was that uh, um, MIT labor professor and uh, uh, North Carolina, uh, law professor got a hold of uh, billing records for how you know lawyers really do spend their time, and then seeing what could you know looking at what could be automated and not. And, and part of that was then looking at uh, you know legal startups. Um, and one of the guys who for a Toronto firm is who had worked on the Human Genome Project, and he was asked by a friend who was a lawyer and it was head of the startup, uh, take a look at this. He figured, oh, that'll be about like a week's weekend's worth of work. Which, well, four years later, he was still at it. Right? I mean, all of this, and it's, it works best with specific domains. I mean, it's, uh, uh, you know, if you can do a legal profession, medical profession, specific words and things, it's, it, you know, you can make a lot more progress than you can in just, you know, generally, you know, with conversations, trying to figure out what people are saying, right? And, and I mean, to be fair to the machines, I mean, the kind of classic old line on this is from one of the original uh, founders of speech recognition is, is, you know, airplanes don't flap their wings. I mean, machines do it differently. So that's not um, necessarily a problem. It doesn't have to be like humans do it. I mean, the way, the way humans do it. But the output has got to be something that we would recognize as, as you put it, understanding. Talk to us about your policy on news embargoes. Um, Usually I'm fine with them because they're not going to be stories anyways. <laughs> I mean, look, if it's something, in a sense, if it's something that's coming, look, this is how something came to you and you wouldn't know it otherwise. I mean, you're sort of dishonest to say, you don't, you know, you don't, you know, you're not going to take an embargo. If you, that's fine, that's to take an embargo, then you're not going to look at it. Um, you know, it, it's, yeah, I don't do a ton of daily stuff. I mean, I think the guys at the journal take a different approach to this, right? Because if you're a real beat reporter, right, you have to, um, you know, you, you don't want to be held back by the company, right? And then there's other things. I just uh, got a piece for the 
will run tomorrow. It's it's based on new research by, that a bunch of uh, scientists have done, which was being published in the, the, the journal Science at 2 p.m. tomorrow afternoon. Uh, yeah, do I agree with the embargo? Sure. I mean, you know, that's, uh, yeah, I, I, I think it's, you know, it's a judgment call as to how interested you are. And, and you know, it's one thing if you, you know, if you follow the company so closely, you kind of knew this was coming anyways. I mean, I think that's where a lot of really deep, deep reporters were. Uh, but that's not, that's, usually those things are so granular that they're hardly, you know, they're not stories for us. Well, so, let's so say it really is a story. Like Microsoft has some serious new product and, you know, they want the story to come out when it's available, but they want the advanced time to brief you. And you know they're briefing the journal and they're briefing Business Insider and whoever the other usual suspects are. You know, when you before you get into that type of a situation, are there certain questions you're going to want answers to before you decide whether or not you're going to cover it? What would the yeah. terms be? I mean, what I would have to do is get some indication that like product announcements I almost never cover. I mean, companies got to sell their own stuff. That's well, not let's say it's that, the Apple know. Watch or something well, then, of that then, magnitude. Then, yeah, sure. Then we do. I mean, Brian Chan does, I'm sure, right? You know, he's, you know, yeah, no, uh, that if it's, a, if it's, if it's open and shut, sure. I mean, and then there's the debate here. I mean, some of these Apple products we've actually, I think, I think the smartphone, we actually fronted, <laughs> you know, as they put on the front, which, you know, something, when I first joined the paper, it never would have happened taking a commercial product. Are you kidding me, right? You know, it's, you know, it's like an ad, right? Um, whereas, you know, the, the argument is that the story is the story, and these are huge sociological phenomena as well as everything else. So um, I'm still glad I don't have to do it. <laughs> I mean, I can just remember being involved in so many embargoes that were such nail biters because we were so afraid that someone would go early and screw everyone else over. Is yeah. that not something you're concerned about in an embargo situation? Yeah, but look, if you give somebody a word, uh, you know, I mean, that's that's it. I mean, the notion is sort of you're going to agree to a embargo and then consciously break it. I mean, some of these embargoes move around a little. It actually I mean, wasn't they're, conscious. They're, 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 in they're, one there could be case, mis- there could be mistakes. There could be, you know, they can move around and then you kind of miss an email or something. I mean, that that yeah. you know that that'll happen now and again. But you know, I mean, of of the things you worry about in your career. Embargo on a product announcement of the things you're going to think back and make, geez, I wish I would have done that. No, no, I don't think so. Well, what about exclusives? Are you doing a lot of exclusives? And if so, are you, do you have a policy around that? Yeah, I mean, I, what's exclusive is my ideas. <laughs> and that's what animates most of my stories. So I don't, um, you know, I'm not. Um, I don't have the issues that on that front that, um, you know, Dai Wakabayashi who covers Google would, or uh, Mike Isaac who covers Facebook would, or Jack Nikas who covers Apple would, or Karen Weiss who covers Amazon and Microsoft would, right? Um, so it's, it's, you know, it's just far less an issue for me than it is for them. But I mean, you know, always you would prefer to uh, have it exclusively than be part of a pack. Talk to us about you, some of your favorite news sources. Are there any sort of underground kind of niche news sources that you really like and pay attention to? I don't know about it's underground niche news sources, but I mean, I think, you know, I look at the National Bureau of Economic Reports, uh, uh, you know, working papers, and those are circulated every Monday. You know, there's ideas, there's, you know, things that are going on there. Um, um, I used to I used to follow tech meme more than I do now just to see what's kind of out there. Um, um, you know, I, look, I, then there's all the kind of basic stuff. I mean, you know, it's um, there's so you know, Times the Journal, the FT, the, uh, the Bloomberg. I mean, we you know, I, we I live in a household where we subscribe to them all, including the Daily News. Only the New York Post we do not. I mean, part of this is you know we're overseas for all these years. The FT, you know, for old time's sake. Um, but you know. We take all those and then, you know, and then you look, Twitter is, I use it as a recommended reading list. 
Um, and that's, you know, and then you kind of, you know, follow people there that are, you know, that might be useful. And that, you know, that, that's, that's, that's always, uh, you know, um, a toggling question. I mean, if you're really actually doing work, you're not following Twitter, <laughs> right? <laughs> if you're an editor, you are. If you're a reporter, you're not. I mean, you're going deep on individual stuff and talking to people, right? And so how much time you then pull out and look at some of this other stuff or have, you know, have tweet deck going all the time is, you know, that's, that's just not something I'm going to do, but I do follow it. I mean, I, you know, um, do, you, do you listen to any podcasts? Yeah, but most, I mean, I, I, I catch the weekly or the daily at the end of the day. Um, and, and then there's just different ones. I mean, American history tellers is run by a guy out of, uh, is part of the marketing department of, uh, <laughs> Um, Southern Methodist University does some really terrific stuff. I mean, these are, you know, history of the depression, history, these are in episodes, he gets experts to come in. Um, you know, that, that, there are a few others. I Spy is one that uh, uh, Foreign Policy Magazine does on uh, international stuff. So I don't, you know, um, but I'm not, you know, um, I listen to Care Swishers once in a while. Um, it, you know, but I'm, I'm not- sorry, I missed what, that. You listen to I, who? Kara Swisher. Okay. Our account. Um, Recode, which, decode. Which, yeah, exactly, which is, you know, which is more in the, uh, you know, the category that you're talking about. You know, right. I mean, business related, right. Um, um, Do but, you find but, like if you're working on a story and you and you haven't spoken to the subject that to, to characters who might be key to the story, do you ever go on to sort of the podcast world to find them and listen to their appearances on other shows or maybe, you know, is that a resource oh, well, for you podcasting? Sure. Are you using sure. that? Sure. Or you, or, or, you know, YouTube has a lot of presentations that the person's given in the past. I mean, you know, um, CEO who spoke to Stanford or something or something, you know, right. I mean, that all when you're looking at brilliant. YouTube videos and there's a bunch of them and yeah. you've got some which are presentations at conferences and some which are presentations in an academic environment, mm -hmm. would you favor the academic environment? Depends what the subject is. Um, and there aren't usually that many. Um, and I, you know, I, I find them this way everybody else does search. <laughs> Talk to yes. us about your search. I imagine you must have very advanced. I mean, my, I am, I would think, I don't know. I mean, I would think you don't just put a keyword in, you do an advanced Bolayan query. Is that true? No, I use a lot of words though. I mean, so I, you know, um, you know, here's where Google is pretty darn good. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I, Are you using negative I, keywords? This and this, not that, or. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. I mean, that's more, you know, if you do refine things on LinkedIn, you know, you, you know, you can do by company and this and that, it, it, you know, you can put in the filters, but I mean, for, for a regular search, I do not. I, you know, I, I'm so surprised because you're covering these enormous companies and I would think you would get so much noise. Yeah. Although I'm not, uh, I'm almost never trawling randomly. Right. I, I just, you know, it's, I mean, I'm looking for something specific usually. So it's not, can you give That's us an nice. example? Um, yeah, sure. Um, um, you know, FTC filings in, a, in uh, an acquisition case, historically. You know, um, what the vote was and what the, it, with each one of the, you know, so, I mean, one of the great, one of the things that really changes how much it's on public record over the years. I mean, that is, that's a revolution. Um, and then there's, you know, um, Freedom of Information Act filings, which are a, a kind of a dark art. <laughs> I mean, yeah. in some, some places are really good. Some places, you know, you could go forever, right? Your federal agencies yeah. and, you know, well, maybe in the next year, right? Um, where sometimes, you know, bang, you go right away. So if that is, and, and to be honest, we have people who are FOIA experts, you know, right? And that kind of do that. I mean, both in Washington Bureau here and here in New York. So there's, you know, there are people who've mastered those arts or, or as, as well as one can. This so, question so. comes from uh, George Bradley and uh, Ashlyn 
Lapori Rusi. And they're basically interested to know, like, if if you're a PR person that has a stable of academic experts mm -hmm. that are genuine experts in different domains, mm -hmm. how do you promote that as a resource to the media to comment on stories that they're writing? Um, I try to be a matchmaker. In other words, um, you know, see what somebody, you know, pick pick your venue that you'd like this person to appear in and see who's been writing about the subjects that they're experts in. Um, I, one of the ones I, you know, kind of, you know, never use is the stuff that's, you know, right pegged to a, a news event and we've got an off the shelf expert. Um, I should, you know, I, I'm not in that game. I, I should know more than they do <laughs> who the best people are. I mean, you know, most of these fields, I, I, you know, I, that's, um, but in some, um, if, you've, if you've got somebody that's done, particularly done any kind of really recent, you know, relevant research in the area that, that the person's writing about, you know, just let them know. That's interesting. And, so and, Frank, and, Frank, your... and, to be, and to be honest, the filter, the filter for academics is, is, is lower. I mean, you know, they're, look, you know, they're in the business of developing and owning ideas in sense they're marketers, right? Um, but the assumption, true or not, is that, you know, it's a more disinterested inquiry that they're making into the subject. And so, frankly, they get a much, you know, if you're an academic, you get a much better, you know, you're more likely to get a hearing. So, so what, what I heard, I just want to repeat it back to you to make sure I understood. Mm -hmm. Because of your domain expertise, after 30 years covering this, you feel like you know the academics that are worth talking to. You don't necessarily need to be trotted out a stable of new experts every time there's a story because you know them already. Yeah, although you're always looking for different people. Um, um, and I, you know, I probably shouldn't say this, but there's, a, there's, a, it's true. I mean, there's a real effort to balance out these things to make sure they're women and minorities. I mean, nobody's actually doing an absolute count. <laughs> but you know, imagine tenure at a university. You're a white male. There's no, you know, you better have invented a cure for cancer, <laughs> right? And so, so it's no different. I mean, we're a, you know watered down version of that. But I mean, you know, it's. There is, and I've had people ask me, I mean, is there, you know, is there a quota? No, there isn't, but there's, you know, there's a leaning toward that direction. So, I mean, new people, I'm not, you know, it's not like I know everybody, right? And new people come up all the time, including in antitrust, right? You know, or any of these kind of um, familiar fields. Um, so, yeah, always looking, but I'm not, you know, um, you know, stories, that, uh, you know, emails that say, you know, what stories are you working on and can I help you? Right. Aren't very helpful. Yeah. It's just Here's an interesting question from Greg Wise. He says, um, do editors or publishing folks judge coverage in the Times by how many clicks it receives or how many times it gets shared? Yeah, everything's measured. Um, and that's a signal, but it's not, you know, um, it's, it's, you know, you're guided by it. You're not ruled by it. I mean, the sense that, you know, look, we're going to, look, we're going to, you know, in the day, I mean, you know, we have a Kabul bureau, right? I mean, the, the amount of people in Rod Norland, uh, for example, was there. And, you know, I mean, the number, the resources spent on that are immense. I mean, are they, you know, uh, what percentage of clicks are you going to get? No, I mean, if we did it only by click, I mean, we do do a lot of opinion. We do a kind of smarter living stuff and then any big news, right? I mean, that, that's just not, I mean, that's not what we're going to do. Um, so, yeah, you do it, but it, it does it have an effect? Sure, it does. <laughs> I mean, if, if you do, look, but if you, if you do a story and you sort of, you know, this is what I ought to do, right? It's just, it's, 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 you know, it's good subject. It's, we ignore it otherwise, yada, yada, yada. And it gets, you know, 20,000 page views, which is nothing for us, right? Um, you know, you say, am I going to do one of these again, right, next time around? Because they all take more time than you think, right? Um, so, yeah, no, it has, it has. And, 
we, we measure everything. There's not, I mean, to, to pretend that that's not a factor is, is the case, but it's also, it's not, um, you know, I don't really know BuzzFeed, but in my, my impression was in the day, I mean, you know, there was, you know, it's kind of a skin rat following of, you know, what, what attracted, you know, um, what attracted clicks, right? And, and also what's really changed, of course, is that advertising is a false god. I mean, the, the view was at one time that you had to, like, we, frankly, we had a, a tech blog, right? For, between, like, off the top Bits. of my head. Two, two, yeah, Bits two, blog, but, remember? But two, like 2011 to 2016. It ended in 16, right? And, you know, how, whatever, you know, you know, the justification was always this is a way you can kind of harvest new material, um, you know, things that are in your notebook and yada yada. And you know, the idea was that you know, you know you're supposed to do it a couple times a week in addition to everything else, right? That was a PR person's dream <laughs> because then a product announcement, so, you know, you kind of get two other calls, right, or two or three other calls. You put a short story, and you could write it in a looser tone, which is you know, sort of fun. But it, you know, a proper job took the better part of a day, right? And so. You know, and they were set up. They were often pegged to some sort of announcement or something, right? And you tried to did your best to broaden them out, but basically this was, you know, the people you who were involved in this, who were part of the announcement were, you know, the amen chorus for the product, right? Um, and part of the, the big, the rationale was that we needed to create more content to sell ads against, right? And what happened, of course, is everybody learned that, oh, by the way, you know, I mean, Ad, online advertising is a great business if your name is Google or, or Facebook and now to some degree Amazon. But everybody who's making it is a subscription business now in publishing. It's us, it's the journal, it's the Washington Post, it's, you know, it's the FT, right? I mean, The Economist. I mean, I see the things that I, I subscribe to and how, you know, New York Times never gave it away, the printed. It was never, you know. It was never cheap, cheap, which is always which was always good, right? Whereas you know the journal, I used to get it for like ninety dollars a year, and then they had to, you know they had this big hunt to find out who, because so much of it was through companies. This big hunt to find out where to send things on the weekend because you know they they didn't you know right there was you know they were corporate subscriptions. Um, you know now it costs five hundred dollars or whatever it is a year, just like the FT does, so like the Times does. It's not you know, and you know. So ads don't matter anymore. So then that, so then it all changed. You know, no, fewer better stories, right? And it, yes, is there a journalistic rationale? Sure there is. But, you know, the business context changed a lot um, of, of what we do. And, and, you know, and now, you know, we also mention shares and engagement and so forth are all, you know, kind of part of the mix. But so, and some, some things are much more, you know, if, if you're writing for, if you're in the cooking product or the crossword puzzle or some of these specialized things, right, which are pure service journalism or entertainment, depending on your point of view, right? Um, those things are, you know, um, the, the volume of viewership and the length of it and so forth is, you know, it's hugely important. Whereas, I mean, if, you know, if you're, if you're doing a, you know, we've hit privacy very hard, for example, um, at the times, a lot of people on it, including on the, the, you know, the editorial side, the op-ed page stuff. Um, you know, it was an institutional commitment to, to do that. And um, if some of these stories don't get a lot of coverage, that's fine. You know, a lot of, you know, we're going to keep covering and keep covering and be on it so that when things do get big, you're, you, you know, you're there. Um, and it's considered an important subject. So um, in his book, AI Superpowers, former Google president Kai-Fu Lee argues China's disregard for personal privacy and intellectual property right, rights and a general nonchalance for personal <clears throat> privacy among Chinese consumers puts China in a stronger position to lead on AI um, because there's no data like more data uh, in a machine learning world. And um, there are fewer data collection restrictions over there. Do you think AI is going to, uh, that China is going to lead on AI? Um, in certain areas it might. Um, I, and then, then there's the question of how much you can export it. 
you know, this is Belt and Road and stuff, right? I mean, other, you know, it's extend to other places. And we've done stories on that, including, you know, Latin America, not just Asia. Um, but I, yeah, I, I would argue there's diminishing returns to data that, you know, and there's a whole debate in the AI world as to, you know, uh, the limits to the, uh, the absolute brute force, uh, you know, data approach. Um, it only gets you so far. Um, so I, look, I, the, the only honest answer is it remains to be seen. Right? <laughs> um, but, and then there's, you know, this whole kind of, you know, whether it's true or not, um, I think China's much better positioned, for example, to do these things than Japan. We feared Japan was in the eighties. And I was over there in the early eighties, right? This is just after Ezra Vogel at Harvard had written Japan is number one. And this is, uh, you know, there was concern about Americans being reduced to sweeping up around the, uh, the supercomputers and flipping burgers at McDonald's, right? That was Mondale's famous line. Um, my sense, I mean, I don't, I don't know China as well as, uh, as well as I kind of knew Japan. It's, it's a more individualistic place, so there's more upside, you know, for China than there was in China. I mean, I remember having this conversation with Bill Gates about, you know, why didn't Japan? I mean, you know, highly literate, of STEM education, terrific. Why didn't they develop, you know, software business? <laughs> you know, that were really competitive with the United States. Um, and oh, but you know, it's not. It's also 125 million people. It's not, it's a big, big market even there. Um, and his, you know, his argument was, you know, individualism and so forth, right? Um, I think China's a much better place than that than, than, you know, in some ways. And, and even their education system and their willingness to, you know, go out into the world, you know, all the Chinese students everywhere um, in our university. So, I, you know, we'll see. We'll see. I, I, but I don't think... Um, I don't think just data is manifest destiny in AI. You know, that line, there's no data like more data, uh, was coined by Cambridge Analytica founder, Robert Mercer. And uh, Cambridge Analytica used psychographic profiling for political advertising. And so obviously the more data they have, the better they can target those ads. Uh, any thoughts on how psychographic profiling will show up in the epic, in the upcoming presidential election? Yeah, again, I mean, we have people who, you know, who that's their full time beat here. So um, I, I assume more of the same. I'm personally unconvinced that um, it does more than magnify what's already there. I mean, I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I am reluctant to believe that people are skin or rats, <laughs> you know, only responding to the stimuli they have, you know, I, I, um, but uh, that said, I mean, let's face it, a lot of this has, you know, this is deterring some people from going to the polls, encouraging others, revving up the base and so forth. And, and everything we've read suggests that, you know, um, you know, the current administration was extremely good at it. Um, and others are kind of trying it as well. So I, you know, I, I one would think, wouldn't yeah. they, that <laughs> the more of this fake stuff's around, the, the higher your filter is. Um, but, you know, we'll see. Steve, thanks for taking the time to do this. You've always thanks, been thanks. so thanks, generous. Thanks, I want to do a, a final shout out to EFF, the Electronic Freedom Foundation, Great. protecting your personal privacy online. More information at ericschwartzman.com forward slash EFF. I want to thank our gold sponsors, Flux Branding, a world-renowned resource for defining your visual brand. Flux Branding is a group of creative visionaries and graphic designers dedicated to helping clients conceptualize and realize their brands online at fluxbranding.com and Digital Dragon, where children can develop the skills they need to prosper in the age of machines. Digital Dragon teaches digital literacy to tomorrow's programmers and technology entrepreneurs. More information at digitaldragon.com. Um, I want to invite you all to join us next week for a discussion beyond the news beat and conducting accurate, timely journalist research so you can deliver your news to the right reporters with Muckrack CEO Greg Gallant. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'm currently completing an extensive report on the state of news media and social media monitoring platforms. If you'd like a free copy, you can sign up at um, 
for my PR Tech Secrets email newsletter at ericschwartzman.com forward slash blog. And that'll cover using AI to monitor for relevancy and sentiment, monitoring articles behind paywalls, advanced bowling and filtering, monitoring for business impact, PR attribution, and more. And you can get that. Uh, again, sign up for a copy at ericschwartzman.com forward slash blog. Um, if you're not watching this live, you can go to PRTechWednesdays.com and register to attend these free weekly PR Tech briefings every Wednesday. And if you're watching on YouTube, please like and uh, subscribe to the channel. This has been Eric Schwartzman. Um, thank you so much, Steve. Thank you. Um, we'll see you next Wednesday. <laughs> Thanks. Bye-bye.